Welcome, Mitya. Hey, Welcome, hey. Gunnar. There. Hello, hello. Hi. It's, it's so nice to be here. <laughs> yes, uh, as you mentioned, Absolutely. so <clears throat> I was a red hat and I'm wearing my red t shirt, red, not t shirt, but hoodie right now. So I'll keep it. Gunnar is not wearing the red hat. Why? Uh, no, actually, I'm not. I got it in the shelf next to me, but I, you know, I don't wear it that often. <laughs> but it's there. Uh, you got a red wire here, uh, and it will won't be so comfortable to have it on your uh, headphones, I guess. Or you yeah, should make so. a it's special actually, hat for headphones. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, I guess it would just be a bit warm. <laughs> Yes, uh, so it's so wonderful to hear you have you here, Gunnar, this morning. Uh, so we had a wonderful chance to meet you actually uh, exactly a year ago there in St. Petersburg live when you gave you a wonderful right. talk. And uh, uh, this is, by the way, the first time we actually meet in person. Uh, and I really hope that we will be able to meet again soon in person. But now we are in a virtual space and it's so good to be connected like from these three locations. Um, Absolutely. So how is there in Hamburg? You still see Airbus is flying there, checking something? Oh, <laughs> uh, well, uh, that's actually on the other end of the city. So, uh, you know, I see them sometimes because, you know, they have this one huge uh, one, which is called the Beluga, which brings actually yes. parts of the aircraft from other factories in Toulouse in France, um, for instance, here to Hamburg. And actually, when this one comes, I actually, it's flying over my house. So I, I see it quite often, but I haven't seen it lately. So I'm not sure what they do. I believe they also, like, you know, reduced our and stuff like that so let's hope we oh, can okay. continue with a more normal mode sometime soon yeah so when you see more belugas then it means that we have a better pandemic situation and everything will fly better okay so good exactly right. um, yes uh, uh you know the the, the talk about the bezium uh uh the last year was uh, was really one of the Best talk, by the way, the conference. So people liked it very much, oh, and the technology uh, is 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 much appreciated. So we are really happy that uh, uh, you, actually, as a leader of the bees and the creator of this thing, are still with us and able to deliver a new talk <laughs> about it. Uh, and um, you know, I, I believe the community is waiting for it. As Gleb mentioned, I'll mm -hmm. be I'll be on the chat. I'll be the back office. So I. Uh, strongly encourage uh, the people to ask questions. I will interrupt yeah. if it's uh, the question is relevant, or after it we will uh, just uh, spend more time like discussing them. And uh, as in uh, uh, previous uh, talks, like there will be a discussion zone. So please don't hesitate. Uh, we have the author of technology. Um, which is which is uh, highly appreciated. So Gunnar, I believe the air is yours. Thank you. I'll be the back office. All right. Dmitry Gleb, thank you so much for having me and thanks for the nice introduction. Um, so as, as you mentioned, I was at JokerConf last year in St. Petersburg and obviously I would much have preferred to be there in person again this year, but well, things are as they are and I'm very thankful for you to invite me again. And so, well, last year I did the talk about the BSM itself. It was like an introductory talk. So I was telling people what it is about, what are the use cases for this, why would you be interested in using change data capture and the BSM? And now Can I thought, okay, the slides let's... on the screen. Uh, would that be a possibility? Yeah. Um, so I, I keep going. Let me know if, if it's a problem. It's shared for me on, on Zoom. Okay, then you can um, just keep going. So I thought I will build on top of that and I will discuss a bit what we can do with uh, when we combine Debezium as a source for change data events and then Kafka Streams. And Kafka Streams is a very interesting library um, which allows us to do stream processing. And now combining Debezium and CDC together with Kafka Streams, this enables many, many interesting possibilities and many more use cases. So that's the idea for, for this talk. And it's organized really um, three parts. So first of all, I We'll do a quick recap for those folks who have not been there last year. So what is the Bezium? What is change data capture? Um, what are like the key use cases? But also if you have been there last year, there's a few new things in that part, so you wouldn't be too bored about it. But really then I will talk about 
Kafka streams. So what is this and why we want to use it? And then actually there's this another very interesting, exciting technology, which is called Quarkus. And Quarkus is, um, well, as we will see, a framework for building cloud native um, applications. And this can also be used to build your Kafka streams applications. So we will talk about how we can build Kafka streams applications using Quarkus for the JVM and also CrawlVM. And lastly, in the third part, um, well, I take those things together and we will talk about how we can can combine the Beesum and Kafka streams and implement use cases like enriching your data, um, auditing, um, doing things like aggregating views coming from multiple topics, those kinds of things. So that's the idea for the talk. As Dimitri was saying, um, definitely uh, bring up your questions in the chat. It's a long session, so I don't feel like talking for one hour, <laughs> like one way. So please, whenever you got something, um, let me know. And definitely, I, you know, I will uh, try to remember and ask for uh, for your questions uh, at some points in, during the talk. All right, so let's get started. A few words about myself. So as uh, Kleb was mentioning, I was I work as a software engineer at Red Hat. I'm the lead of the Debezium project. So this is really at the core of the talk today. I'm involved with a few other projects. There's, um, well, Quarkus, I mentioned that. Um, I've been working on Hibernate-related projects for a, a while, one of them being Bean Validation. So I was the spec lead for Bean Validation 2.0. And um, well, if you're using Java EE or now Jakarta EE or Spring, well, you might use Bean Validation and you might use this API. There's a few other um, projects I'm involved with. Um, maybe you've heard about Larry, which is a uh, launcher for modularized layer Java apps. So that's a new thing I work on on the site. So that's also something to check out. And well, if you are curious, you know, um, I'm on Twitter. So there you can learn about more. Um, you can learn more about those projects, what's going on. So definitely, I would invite you to follow me there. So now let's talk about Debezium and change data capture and. Well, the idea behind it is quite simple. So it really, it essentially is about getting change events out of your database. So let's say you have a MySQL database or you have a Postgres database or a few other ones which are supported. Well, whenever there's a change, so something gets created, something gets updated or a record gets deleted, Debezium would get notified about this change by tapping into the transaction log and then it would capture this change and it would send it towards consumers. And those consumers, they can react to those change events. And then, well, this allows us to do many interesting things with those change events, right? So we can just think about replication. We can think about updating a cache, um, all those kind of things, really. And we will talk a bit more about use cases in a bit. Um, but really, that's the, that's the core idea behind it. So it taps into the transaction log of a database, streams changes, uh, into um, Apache Kafka typically. So Kafka, that's the fabric, the messaging infrastructure, which most of the consumers of Debezium use to connect Debezium and then those what we call sync connectors. And a nice thing about this is that this all is a matter of configuration. So you don't need to program anything really here. It's a matter of putting those connectors in place in Kafka Connect. And Kafka Connect is another framework, a runtime, which is part of the Kafka umbrella. And this is really the runtime for those connectors. So you have a separate cluster of Kafka Connect nodes. They run those connectors, in this case, the Debezium connectors. And then those connectors will send those change events from the database into Apache Kafka. And now what's really cool about this is there's a rich ecosystem of um, connectors for all kinds of um, data sources and data things. So what you can do is you can take a connector for a cache like InfiniSpan, or you can take a connector for a search index like Elasticsearch, your data warehouse, Snowflake, all those kinds of things. And you just can configure those connectors and they will then subscribe to those topics in uh, Apache Kafka and they will take the data change events coming from Debezium and send them towards um, those external data sources. Now, um, there's, you know, there's really like hundreds of connectors out there. And one which I think is in particular interesting is the Apache Camel uh, connector. So maybe you've heard about Camel, which is a rich integration framework. And now they also support running all the Camel connectors via Kafka Connect. So bringing like those hundreds of Camel connectors into this Connect ecosystem. So that's the key part. It's um, like a, you know, you don't need to code, and it's all. This also means it's a it's in, um, independent from the specific environment or runtime you're in. So just the other day, I learned about a very nice demo which was based on .NET. So I mean, all we do here, this is based on and Kafka. This runs on the JVM, but really, you can have those other ecosystems like .NET and WhatNet, whatnot, and they will, um, you know, also be able to connect to such a data streaming pipeline. 
So it's um, no code, but then also it's low latency. So this is uh, from a, a user story, I would say. It's from a company called Convoy, and they um, had a traditional batch way for streaming that changes out of the operational database into their data warehouse. And this chart, this shows the latency they had between the point in time when a data event occurred in the database and then when they actually saw this data in their data warehouse. And you can see, well, this used to be, uh, well, first of all, quite volatile, and it was fluctuating between like one hour, sometimes even three hours, so quite, quite a delay. And then you can see, well, at some point, they switched over to change their capture into Debezium, and suddenly they have this very low latency. So now this would be for them, maybe it's in a matter of minutes until they have that data in the data warehouse, but really you can't even go further below. So I'm aware of users, they connect their MySQL databases via Debezium to Kafka, and then they have a sync connector for Google BigQuery, which is their data warehouse, and they have the data in the data warehouse um, in less than two seconds. So really it's like near real time analytics, which you can do um, by using this technology. So this is why I'm really excited about this. So now, um, as I mentioned, those uh, Debezium connectors, they tap into the transaction log of the database. And this means um, we need to have a dedicated, a bespoke connector for each supported database. Because, well, there's just not one single API which we could use, which we could implement this for all kinds of databases. So there's, you know, the bin log in MySQL for Postgres, it's using logical replication, and there's a different way for getting change events out of, um, from all those um, different databases. But then, well, Debezium has a, I would say, wide support for now the commonly used databases. Just recently, we added, for instance, this one for Vitesse, which essentially is a sharding layer on top of MySQL, which is, um, by the way, really cool because this is driven by the community. So, um, well, this is a Red Hat sponsored project, but then there's also other people and lots of people from the community working on this. And for instance, this connector for Vitesse, this actually has been contributed and the work is led by engineers of a company called Bolt. So it's a, a ride hailing service in Europe. Um, so they work on this Vitesse connector in the within the Debezium open source umbrella. So that's very nice. And now also those connectors, they try to expose a uniform event representation. So then for you as a consumer, you don't really need to care too much about does this event come from MySQL? Does it come from Postgres or Oracle or Vitesse? Really the idea is to give you a uniform event representation making it easier for use for you to consume those those change events. And then of course, you know, we are always on the look uh, for adding new connectors. So for instance, MariaDB, this comes up pretty often. Um, so definitely we listen to the community. Um, what are your requests there? Or maybe as the Vitesse, uh, or sorry, as the Bolt uh, folks did. And by the way, also the Cassandra one, that, that's another connector which is led by the community. So this is from engineers of a company called WePay. Uh, um, so you also would consider to add a connector under the Debezium umbrella. So that's definitely a possibility. All right. So now let's talk a little bit about the structure of those change events, because this is really what this is about, right? So how do those events look like? And well, if you use Kafka, then you will know in, uh, messages in Kafka, they have a message key and a message value. So how do those things key and value look like? Well, with the key, um, this is really representing the primary key of your table. So let's say you have a single primary key column. Well, then the message key in Kafka would just have a single field. If you have a composite key, well, then the key of the message in Kafka would be a complex structure with all the key columns being represented. And this is very important because this uh, the message key in Kafka is used to determine into which partition a change event is being sent or any message is being sent really. So you can partition topics to spread out the load of this data across multiple nodes. And now what's important to know is the order of events, this is only guaranteed within a single partition. And now because we sent all the events of this, let's say customer 1004, they will all have the same primary key. So this means they will all go into the same partition of this topic. Um, well, then a consumer is guaranteed to see those change events in the per exact order as they were produced. And well, obviously that's very important. So you don't end up with inconsistent data. So that's the key. And then the value, this is really the structure which we see on the right hand side here. It's a complex structure, which essentially has three parts. So the first one is like, what's the previous state of the row? Second part is what's the new state of the row. And finally, there's some metadata, like what's the name of the database, name of the table where this event is coming from. 
maybe the query which triggered this change, stuff like that. Position in the off in, in the uh, bin log, all those kinds of metadata. And now those before and after elements, they resemble again the structure of your table. So for each column by default, you would have their one field, but of course you can override this, you can customize it, you could change field names, you could remove columns, you could you know mask column values. Let's say you have some sort of um, sensitive data, you don't want to expose this to your downstream consumers, so then you could filter this out, things like that. So that's the semantical structure of the change events. But then there's also the matter, how does this actually get serialized in Kafka? And there, into Kafka, because in Kafka, well, everything is a byte array, binary data. So we need to think about how we get from the semantical structure to our binary representation. And this is where this notion of converters in Kafka Connect comes in, because, well, they take this structure um, and serialize it into JSON, so that's what we would see here, or into Evro if you want to have a more efficient, compact binary representation. And you could have custom converters too. So I know from the Debezium community, we have users which, for instance, use Google protocol buffers um, as the serialized format because, well, their entire data engineering setup and ecosystem is geared towards protobuf, so that's what they also want to use with their Debezium changements. And you can actually do this. And then there's a very important um, component to mention in this context, and this is a schema registry. And the thing is, well, a consumer, they need to know how to interpret such a message which they receive. So um, in case, I, I think it's apparent because you just get this binary data to know what is the Evro schema. Um, so actually I, as a consumer, can interpret and you know deserialize this binary. So that's why I need to have the schema information. Now, putting the schema into each and every message, this would be quite verbose. It would be quite an overhead because if you think about it, the schema of your messages, it doesn't really change that often, right? Because the schema, it's derived from the structure of your tables. And you don't do, well, typically, you don't do DDL changes every day. You don't add a column or you don't rename a column like every day. So this means your schema, this is pretty constant, and putting it into every message would be, uh, well, just an overhead. And this is why such a schema registry is a very good thing, because it allows you to externalize the schema information. And then it would look like this. So. You again have the simple pipeline with the Debezium connector. It gets data from Postgres, sends them to Kafka topics, and then there's some sort of sync connector, Elasticsearch in this case. Now you have this external component, which is the schema registry, and you have different options there. And one of them is um, the Epicurio registry, which is an open source, a fully open source schema registry. But then there's also in the cloud events umbrella, they work actually on a spec for having a standardized schema registry interface. So there's quite a few options there. And now what happens is- By the way, in, Gunnar, the source... uh, may I just yeah, interrupt sure. you for a second? Because we got our first Absolutely. question actually from Nikita, sure. as you were mentioning, as you were mentioning uh, Postgres, uh, there are some issues with the Postgres connector, I guess, in Debezium. <laughs> if Postgres is clustered okay. with two instances, there are some cases where we might lose data uh, when failover is happening. Well, are there any, yes. any specific settings to avoid this to guarantee 100% reliability? Yes, so yes and no. So first of all, while this question goes straight to the meat of it, and <laughs> definitely, so this failover situation in Postgres, that's, um, that's a limitation, that's for sure. Unfortunately, right now, there's not much we can do about it from a Debezium perspective, because the thing is, um, while well, we use there what's called a replication slot, and this replication slot, this is essentially, you know, uh, our connection to the Postgres database and also describes how far have we consumed this uh, the, the, the transaction log to write a headlock in Postgres. And now, what Postgres at the moment still is lacking is over replication slots. Right now, you just don't have a way where you would be able to, um, you know, take this replication slot, resume it from a standby, which now maybe is the new primary node, and you would be able to continue from there. So that's a limitation in Postgres. So what you typically can do there is, um, let's say if you pl plan ahead for the failover, you can essentially go your uh, with your application to some sort of um, read-only mode. So you essentially uh, have a phase where you don't do any writes, if this is possible from, from a business point of view. And then, well, you could have Debezium consume all the change events from the old primary, then fail over, start with a new slot, and you would just be sure you wouldn't have lost anything. Then the other option would be to do um, what's called a snapshot. So actually, um, what the Debezium connectors also can do is they can take a you know a full snapshot of the current data um, and then resume the log. So this would be 
liking, I guess, after such a failover with Postgres. Um, but yeah, depending on the amount of data, it might not be desirable. So long story short, um, you know, there's some ways to work around it, but definitely it's a limitation, which I very much hope will be addressed in Postgres anytime soon. Oh, thank you so much, so, I guess, I hope... Nikita. When you have more questions, join us at the discussion zone to go to into deeper details, I guess. Okay, Gunnar, let's go ahead. Right, thank yeah. you. Thank you, Nikita, for the question. Yeah, absolutely. Right, so coming back to the schema registry, so what would happen is, a you know, the converter on the source side, they would put the schema into this registry and they would just add a message ID, uh, sorry, a schema ID to the actual messages which are sent to Kafka. And then the converter on the sync side, they can go to the registry and resolve the schema and interpret the message there. So that's the way um, to work with the schema registry and it allows you for much more efficient messages, uh, less overhead and things like that. So that's definitely what people use a lot in, in production. So now, um, as I mentioned, Dvisium, most of the times it's used with Kafka and Kafka Connect, but really, um, you know, as I know, there's many advanced um, folks here in the audience. I thought I'd just quickly share uh, other ways of how you could use Dvisium. And the one is, you can not actually use it also as a library in your um, Java application. So you embed it into your own process, which gives you lots of flexibility, right? So maybe you just want to invalidate some application internal cache, things like this. This is very interesting then to use this embedded library. And then we also have what's called Debezium server. So that's a pretty new component of Debezium. And actually it's its own dedicated runtime for those connectors. And then you could send those all kinds of messaging infrastructures. So currently there's support for Kinesis, Apache Pulsar, Google PubSub, actually also um, Azure Event Hubs that's still missing here. And this is also pluggable. So you could also add more of those, um, you know, plugins for those uh, um, messaging infrastructures, let's say. And again, you know, this gives you some more flexibility and um, it just widens the range of um, use cases and situations where people can work with Debezium. Okay, so, um, and what I sh also should mention now, because I see this question comes up pretty often, so why do we actually do this kind of log-based change data capture? Couldn't we also go to the database and just query for changes? So we could go to our tables and ask, hey, has there been some data change in the last five seconds? Things like that. So that's what I would call a query-based CDC approach. And now the question is, why would I not, uh, what, what's the difference really? I would say, well, there's um, quite a few advantages to the log-based approach. So first of all, you will be able to capture all the changes. So um, if you think about the query-based approach, well, um, let's say you have two updates in a very close time um, to each other. Um, it might be if you have this polling based approach, you just miss the first update. You only see the current state when you do the polling, right? So this means you wouldn't be able to capture all the events. And then you also would not query like every second because, well, this just creates lots of load on the database. So um, there's, um, you know, you won't miss any changes with the log based approach. Um, you also have no polling delay. So really, this happens um, in a push based fashion and we get those change events very quickly. For the is. Also, the log-based approach is transparent to your writing applications. So if you think about the querying based, query based approach, well, you would have to have some sort of column in your data tables, which allows you to identify when have they been changed or modified for the last time. So you need to care or you need to cater for that in, in your data model. Whereas <clears throat> with the log-based approach, well, um, this is needed, right? So there's no restrictions or limitations on your table model. And also, we can get deletes. So if you think about it, uh, well, if something gets added and deleted between, let's say, two polling attempts, well, a, we would never know about it, right? Because the record is gone already. Whereas if we do the log-based approach, well, also deletes are uh, added as an event to the write ahead log. And this means, well, we also will be able to capture deletes and propagate this information to consumers that the record has been deleted. There's one advantage to the query-based approach. Um, this usually, well, as long as you can talk to a database, let's say via JDBC, you could implement this, right? So this is, let's say, more portable, but then otherwise, if there actually is a connector, a log-based connector like Debezium for your database, I would argue that's the one you should be using because of all those advantages. 
So now let's talk a bit about some use cases. And um, well, we already saw some of them, right? So you can use it for replicating data, updating your search index, updating your, your cache, but then there's quite a few more. And this actually is what I'm going to focus uh, a bit more on in this talk. And this are, these are all those use cases which benefit from adding stream processing to the mix. So we can do things like streaming queries, um, you know, reacting to your data changes, aggregate it and, uh, you know, provide some derived answer to some sort of query. And instead of having to execute this query and ask for the current result, this would be updated in a push-based fashion whenever something has changed. So that's streaming queries. Um, or you could think about denormalizing views. You could think about auditing logs, audit logs. And I will talk about those use cases um, in a bit and real day benefit by combine, they benefit from combining the BSIM and Kafka streams. So I hope that, uh, you know, it's a good recap for what is the BSIM for folks who haven't heard about it. So now let's talk about, about um, Kafka streams. But before talking, and, uh, sorry, Kafka's, sorry, sorry. That's a question, I guess. Uh -huh, yeah, but yeah, sure. but yeah, yes, it's not exactly a question. It's a question from my side, and I guess uh, it's a question reasonable for, for the first part of this talk. Is it actually about, uh, well, well, CDC, uh, actually, you almost you invented this uh, this uh, combination of words, but pulling the data out of always have to a little bit hack in to the database to get these changes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Is there any movement that uh, actually the d database itself should provide you an API or a, or a, I would say a legal yeah. way to do this? Uh, or it's yeah, yeah. I mean, first uh, of all, okay, it's, it's completely legal. Okay. Yes. <laughs> uh, no, legal. I mean, uh, I would call it like a part of uh, of supported um, API. Yeah, I support an API. Yeah, yeah, right. I mean, so it differs uh, between the different databases a bit, right? So. Um... Postgres, where we tap into the logical replication stream. So that's definitely an official API. So you can use this. Um, the same for MySQL. Um, you know, for SQL Server, let's say we, there we use its CDC feature. But what I definitely see is if you look at newer databases, um, let, let's say uh, stuff like Yugabyte, they come with CDC support out of the box or also we test. So they have a really a properly documented uh, official first-class CDC support. And definitely that's something I expect uh, going as databases evolve or if new databases get created, that they have this capability in a you know nice to consume way out of the box, definitely. Okay, that means that uh, CDC is becoming part of actually of uh, most uh, engines like documented part and uh, you are getting use of it via Debezium in, in a, in a, in right, a exactly. reasonably good way. Okay, that's, thank that's, you very much. Let's I... go ahead. Right. Okay, so now let's talk a bit about uh, Kafka streams and, and uh, Quarkus really. And well, Kafka streams, I mean, there could be a dedicated talk just about Kafka streams, but really in a nutshell, it's an API which allows you to do st stateful stream processing. And what it means is essentially, it's a, you know, this classic approach where you take data, um, you read data, you process it and you write it back. And this is what's happening in, um, with Kafka here. So essentially um, you have things, uh, you know, Kafka uh, topics. So in this case, I have an example with weather stations, so, but it doesn't really matter. So those they exist in Kafka. You have a Kafka streams application, which reads from those topics, does some processing, ring mapping, joining, all those kinds of things, and then writes back the data to another Kafka topic and yeah, you can process data. So that's, that's what Kafka streams gives you. And it's a Java-based API, which means, well, you need to have some sort of runtime or let's say environment where you where you run this. It comes with a rich set of operators. So you can do things like filtering, mapping, grouping, aggregating, joining. So really, I mean, all what you would expect from a query language, really. Um, so that's the things you can do there. And then it has a very interesting scaling model. So as I mentioned, topics in Kafka, they are partitioned. Now, um, Kafka streams, benefits from that because you can scale out a Kafka streams application and then they would each process a subset of the uh, partitions and a subset of the data and share the load of your Kafka streams application across 
models. And then if you remember um, this uh, notion of ordering and all the change events of one customer or one purchase order and so on, they all go into the same um, partition of a Kafka topic. So this means also such an instance of such a scaled Kafka Streams app would then process all the records from this customer or this purchase order. So that's the idea behind it. And then lastly, there's also a notion of interactive queries. So instead of just writing out data to another topic, you also can actually uh, go to a, what's called a state store and get just a current state which has been aggregated for a given key. So let's say you aggregate some data for a customer, you could go to the state store and extract the current state of this aggregation from the state store and then expose it via a web application. So how does such a Kafka Streams app look like? And now this is another example. And as you see, you actually can run this in your main method. And what you see is there, well, you need to configure it. So you have things like those, um, um, you know, application ID, what, where's my Kafka broker? So now obviously hard coding this in my app is not ideal. So we should think about it. Then I have those topic names. So first of all, I also need to configure those. But then also what you need to know is this Kafka Streams app, it actually won't start up if this topic doesn't exist. So maybe we could have some means of just making sure topics exist before we start. So now then I do my actual stream processing there. I group this and now this is a very basic example which just counts the words in a given stream and then it writes it out to a different topic. And now what I also need to do is I need to register this shutdown hook. So just to make sure if the process finishes that uh, all the resources are cleaned up. And well, again, that's a bit of boilerplate. And now, wouldn't it be nice if we had some support of that? And this is where Quarkus and this Kafka Streams extension comes in because it provides us with, you know, some things which help us to, to do this. So, and I will touch on that later on. All right. So now, what about, what is Quarkus? I mentioned it a few times. And well, if you go to its website. Honor, um, if you, if you don't mind, uh, I will mm. just break you in a little bit. Sorry, before going to Quarkus. Quashita, <laughs> they have planned to create Oracle connector without Oracle Golden Gate, actually. For this thing yes uh, so we do have uh, now an incubating implementation which is based on the log miner package um so this is part of the oracle database you can use it as part of your you know this is kind of licensed and we have an incubating connector which takes advantage of that so you don't need golden gate you don't need uh, to have its license um so this is definitely something you should try out it's currently work in progress this also has been contributed by the community so definitely we would appreciate your feedback on that very much okay lovely thank you uh now we can switch to practice right. thank you right cool so quarkus and you know, just to give you the definition, the definition from the website. Um, well, let's say Kubernetes native Java stack tailored for OpenJDK hotspot and GraalVM, so it targets those both runtimes, crafted from the best of free Java libraries and standards. So now, what does it really mean, or why do we have the thing? And well, I would say the motivation for coming up with Quarkus is that um, you know the guys working on this they figured out well Java is a bit of, of at the risk of falling behind when it comes to implementing your workloads on the cloud. So there is things like you would quickly rescale your application. You need to start, you know, let's say you have tons of requests coming in suddenly, you would like to scale up this application to many nodes. And now if you have a Java application, which might not be super fast to start, a consumer would just have to wait for a new node to come up. So you want to quickly scale up, also scale down. And then also you want to do this sort of dense packaging, right? So you want to have many uh, nodes potentially on your Kubernetes cluster and well, a traditional JVM process and framework, which takes lots of RAM potentially, this is just not ideal for this kind of deployment, I would say. So this is the, this I, I think it's, oh, that's the motivation really, which led to Quarkus. And now um, let's think about it, why, um, is it, and um, well, as I mentioned, the JVM, this is, um, you know, it has been designed for high throughput, low latency, long running processes. It hasn't been designed with things in mind, like just giving you the quickest start startup. So when Java was created, well, nobody was thinking of things like AWS Lambda or Knative, but you really want to start up in milliseconds so you can have a good cold start performance. So nobody really was addressing that back in the day. Um, and also memory overhead, right? Why, where is this coming from? Well, if actually, if you have a Java application, it, it's not only about your heap there, but there's also lots of other memory parts associated with that. So there's class metadata, there's all the code which gets produced by the JIT, um, the garbage collector, this itself needs to have some memory for its internal data structures. So really you have actually 
quite some memory overhead there. And also, well, if you think about the startup overhead, well, just loading all the classes, then warming up the shit, um, all those things, this, this take, uh, these, um, take their time. And the, um, that's why we perceive the JVM maybe to, you know, not be yet suited for those kinds of use cases. So that's, that's the idea behind it. And now, what can you do with Quarkus? And well, this is just taken from the website there. And well, this changes the picture quite a bit because if you look at the numbers, well, now suddenly, if you look at a startup time in uh, below a second, if it's on the OpenJDK, and it's like, um, uh, you know, for this basic REST application, and it's uh, 16 milliseconds for a native binary built via Gravium. And the same if you have like a REST and a CRUD application, it's a bit more, but being able to start this up, and this is the time to first run for that's definitely something and now we actually can do those things we can start up this process if a user comes in and maybe we need to cold start this instance so this gets possible and now of course the question is how is this possible so what um you know what does quark has changed in order to enable this and by the way i should say well for kafka streams well we maybe this startup improvement this is not so interesting because our you know, Kafka Streams app, this is running for some time, but then um, the memory improvements which we get here, this is definitely interesting for Kafka Streams because as I mentioned, it has the scale out model. And now if we can, you know, have many more nodes, they just each consume a small amount of memory and I, you would get away, um, I believe, maybe with 40 megabytes or something like this, even including a web server for basic Kafka Streams app. So you can just package those apps in the cloud more densely together. So that's that's why this is also is interesting for Kafka streams. So what is Quarkus doing in order to enable this? And well, to think about or to answer that, you need to think about what does a framework um, have to do when your application starts up. And there's many things like parsing configuration files. If you think about um, uh, things like JPA, you need to parse the persistence XML file. Then you need to do things like class pass scanning so going to your uh, jars and detect all the entities or all the classes which are annotated with at entity so this takes time then you will hibernate will have to build up a meta model right so which describes all the entities how are they mapped to the tables in the database all those kinds of things and you would have this for hibernate or persistence you would have this for your rest layer and so on so you need to build up those meta model objects to do things around reflection. So maybe you um, want to generate some dynamic proxies, you must make methods accessible, all those kinds of things. And finally, you do initiate the IO. So you start up your web um, endpoint, you open a port there, you maybe start some threads, you open your database connection and so on. Now, if you think about it, all those four things, um, those first four things, you actually can do them just once and somehow reuse this information later on and only the only thing which you really need to do at startup time this would be you know initiating the io creating your connections and so on so that's the basic idea behind quarkus and what it call its notion what's called compiled okay. and but tries to do as many things at build time and uh, you know get away with just the bare minimum which needs to be done at the actual application startup mm. This is, yes, lovely. And before going, so we have another question uh, from Andre. Uh, so can we can configure some uh, predicate to capture data? For example, um, uh, since particular moments or where some field are not new. So I'll just read the question from, from Andre. So I hope uh, you understood it. <clears throat> yeah, no, I'm not quite sure I understand it, to be honest. Um... So maybe it gets a bit clearer if so, we talk about well, let, extensions. Let me read it. Yes, maybe I can read it again. Can we configure some predicate to capture data? Question mark. For example, uh, since a particular moment or where the fields are not known. Maybe it's a little bit later on. Yes? Yeah, let's talk about that if we, uh, if we come to extensions or maybe we even take it later on uh, during the discussion zone. Because then okay, so Andre, if context. you can give some, yes, yes, if, uh, if uh, Andre could give us more context, we will get back to it. Thank you. Let's go ahead. Right. So the key idea there is really that Quarkus would do all those things apart from this last step at compile time, right? And then... Um, well, we essentially record this information and we will see how this happens in a bit. And now this means, oh, well, we just first of all, we don't need to do all those things at each application startup, but also it means we need to load less classes because, well, if you don't need to parse in persistence XML file, well, we also don't need to load the XML parser classes. And this just, again, speeds up our process and also it you know, makes 
um, uses less memory because we don't need to load those classes. So that's nice. Um, and then also, you know, we don't need uh, to do or maybe less reflection, which is just nice if you think about using this with a native binary. So that's the idea. And Quarkus, compile time boot. Do as many things as possible at compile time and less things at actual application startup time. So now, um, this actually is implemented via such a build pipeline. I'm not going too much into details there, but what essentially happens is um, there's a set of extensions which do all those things for you at the build time. So let's say there's an extension which takes care of Hibernate, and now this makes sure the class path scanning, this happens at build time, and then um, essentially bytecode uh, gets recorded, which then later on can just be executed to, you know, evaluate this information. So that's the core idea. Also, you know, does things like creating an index with all your annotation metadata. So let's say being validation, there we need to have information about all our, all our constraints. Um, this gets added to an index, which then can be very efficiently consumed and interpreted at, at runtime. So that's what you can do. And now this pipeline, this uh, actually has two targets, let's say. So one would be JDK hotspot, so we can just build a, um, a, a hotspot application, but then it also has support for native binaries via GraalVM. So there, um, we take it to the next level and this will, you know, start up even faster and use even less memory because many, many optimizations are applied there by the GraalVM native binary tool. So it does, um, for instance, all these kinds of dead code elimination. So it will go through your application, will figure out which methods are used, which fields are used, and um, well, then, you know, all the code which you don't use, this doesn't get even added to this image. So that's why it's so efficient. So, but also I should say, Quarkus targets very much the JVM. So by doing all those things already at um, build time, also our JVM processes benefit a lot from that. So that's the entire story around Quarkus about this fast startup, low um, memory usage, but then there's more to it because it's really meant as a full featured application development framework. So there's a very strong notion of developer jobs, what's called the dev mode. This, this shows you um, how to, um, uh, you know, uh, or this allows you to work on your application and very quickly get feedback uh, while you do so. You don't need to reload it and, and, and things like that. There is a notion of uh, it allows you to combine imperative programs. So if things like um, reactive APIs, uh, this is what you enjoy, you can do this. And also it integrates with lots of libraries. And actually for our use case as well, what's interesting is Kafka. So we have support for all the Kafka clients and producers. Kafka streams, but then also the micro profile API. And this is actually a set of specs, which gives us uh, things like configuration, metrics, health checks, and well, this, as we will see, is also very interesting for our purposes. But then there's other extensions for things like Vertex, um, Camel, Hibernate, Rest Easy, all those things. And really, they take care of integrating those things with Quarkus. So, Coming back to those extensions, really, it's it's essentially it's first of all it's a notion of distribution. So this is how you would pull in a specific thing like Kafka Streams. So we pull in the Quarkus Kafka Streams extension, and then what it really does is it takes care of making sure this um, library, which gets integrated, works well within this Quarkus universe. So it you know it tries to do all the things like class path scanning, metadata building, tries to trigger this at build time port information into bytecode and just make sure that this integrated library works well in, in the Quarkus um, ecosystem. But then it also takes care of enabling those things in Qual VM. So as I mentioned, um, it does this dead code elimination. So this means if you do um, load, uh, let's say you do some things via reflection, um, well, the dead code elimination would remove those classes because, well, it wouldn't be able to find out that you actually reflectively try to instantiate some class. So you need to tell the GraalVM native binary tool, well, actually, that's a class I'm going to reflect on. So all, if you don't find any explicit references, please add it still to the image because this is being used by reflection. And um, just to give you an idea of what extensions uh, could do. So they work with this notion of build items. And here I have, uh, you know, that's from the Kafka Streams extension. So there, this just takes this class, the log and fail exception handler, which is like the default exception handler in Kafka Streams. And this is instantiated via reflection in Kafka Streams. And now this is extension makes sure this is registered for reflection so that if we compile this down to a native, memory, uh, native binary, then, um, you know, this class is still present. And of course, um, there's a range of build items. What 
extensions can do, um, you know, adding classes, they can generate new classes, they can generate CDI beans, they can add resources to the image. Um, and there's like a really big range of extensions. But this is just uh, to give you an idea how this would look like. Now, in terms of Quarkus, uh, sorry, in terms of Kafka strings, what it really does is, and we will see it in the demo. So it takes care of starting up the pipeline, making sure all this shutdown hook business is uh, done correctly. It gives you health checks, so you can take a look at what's the status of my application. Metrics support is just got added, so you actually can expose your metrics via HTTP, and this is important because in CraVM native binaries you don't have support for JMX, and well, Kafka streams by ex default it exposes its metrics via JMX, and now. Well, by doing this um, uh, via HTTP and micrometer, um, we can expose this to our external metrics consumers. There's dev mode, so we will see in the demo, this gives you quick feedback while you work on such a pipeline. And then it also takes care of integrating Kafka streams with the Graal, which does all the reflection configuration for the 30s, exception handlers, takes care that RocksDB, which is used for the state store, that this actually can be used and this is added to the native binary. So it makes sure all the things work just out of the box via the JVM, but also via um, native binaries in Kravian. So that's in a nutshell Kafka streams um, and Quarkus. And you know, I did explain a bit more about Quarkus than we would need it for our purposes here, but I felt it's interesting to give you some context why Quarkus is so interesting. And well, we cannot only use it for Kafka streams, but also for our regular web apps, um, even CLI tools if you wanted to. So really it is a general, generic purpose application framework. So that's that's the idea. Any questions at that point, Dimitri? Uh, actually, uh, yes, uh, Andre gave us uh, yeah. gave us uh, gave us more explanation. So I'll try to read it right now. So um, let us do it like this. So I just read it as it is. So I've configured a connector mm -hmm. A for table A for capturing three of ten columns of a table. Uh, it has been processed and published to Kafka topic A. After some time, I realized mm -hmm. that I need more columns. I don't need. Yeah. All Colors for October. I don't know what October is, but uh, yes, no need all columns. I need 10 columns only for records since November. Okay, so that's for one month and other 10 columns for for starting from another month, let us say. I don't want to read the whole mm -hmm. log again because it's really big. So can I configure connector B uh, just for the next 10 columns and switch to it? I hope, I hope uh... uh, you got the question. Yeah. Okay. So I think it will take a bit too far. Uh, it will to take too long to get to that right now. So yes, you Let can. Let us go into discussion zone. Yeah, I, I think it's better suited for that, right? Exactly. Yes. Okay. But so it's, Andre, it's so I, let's, I believe. Let's not forget about it. Yes. Uh, so we have uh, more time at the end. We will get back to it because it really yeah. requires time. Right. Or if we have too much, too, 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 too much time to explain it, please join us at the discussion zone, and uh, right. you have yeah. a live conversation. Thank you yeah. so much. Actually, I feel we we need to go on a bit because, uh, um, yeah, we should take questions probably during the discussion zone because, um, you're, you know, it, yeah, we need time. Longer. All right. So let's let's um, talk about now how we can actually take Kafka streams running on Quarkus and combine this with um, Debezium. And first of all, I want to show a demo there. So let me do that. And I'm uh, playing this back for you. So the idea there is to come back to this example of weather stations and um, temperature values. And now I have data um, which comes from a you know fake sensor. Uh, data source, and I would like to enrich this um, now with master data for the weather stations coming from the database. And I got a few things running here. So I got here um, some source for my temperature values. So this is like, you know, just some fake data, which is coming from a Kafka topic. So we'll see that in a bit. I got um, master data. Oh, actually, let me work it. So I just read this data from the temperature values, and this is just a pair of timestamps and a value. And again, it's some, some random data which gets produced. So then I have um, <clears throat> my, um, I have my stream processing application here. So now this is based on the, on the Kafka streams extension for Quarkus, which means I just have this producer method for CDI. 
And now this is my simple topology here. And for now, it's not doing too much. It really is just taking this data from the one topic and write it out to another topic, right? And have a few surveys for serializing and deserializing the data. So that's what's currently happening, what's currently happening. And then I have, you know, those topic values there injected, or those topic names there injected by the micro profile config API. So I could change them after the fact without having to recompile this application. So what I'm doing now is I'm starting this in a dev mode. Now this um, thing will be running and it will be pick up any changes I'm doing to this code. So now this is running <clears throat> and there it says, well, it's actually waiting for this other topic, weather stations, which makes sense because, um, well, I don't have set up the yet, which would be the source of this data coming from this weather stations uh, table. So I need to configure this and then this pipeline would be able to run, right? So it figured this out from the topology. Okay, this topic still is missing. So what I'm doing is, um, and actually I also can see this in the uh, via the health check API. So if I were to run this in production, I could have this HTTP health check and then I could see, okay, um, you know, this uh, topic still is missing and some administrator could take care and set up the connector. So that's what I'm going to do next. I'm using the Kafka Connect REST API. I put this connector in place and, um, you know, this is just a uh, basic Postgres connector configuration. It has a username, it has a host name, password, port, and so on. It uses JSON for the conversion and it just captures changes from this weather schema. So that's the idea. And then I can take a look into this topic now. And uh, this shows me all those snapshot events. As I mentioned, we can take an initial snapshot of the data. And this is what we see here. So for all the weather stations in this table, I see the initial data. Now there's no changes here yet because, well, I don't change the weather station master data. But so I have the second topic now. So that's good. I see all its attributes. And now I actually can go and make use of this topic in my Kafka Streams application. So that's what I'm going to do next. Uh, I'm going to, um, you know, move forward and implement this application. And the idea there is uh, working with this dev mode. I take a look now at this output topic. So this is where my application writes to this template value enriched topic. And for now, I'm just taking the values from the source topic and write them to the target topic. But now what I can do is I can modify this. So here I'm going to split them up at the semicolon. And then I actually join this with this um, master data topic for the weather stations. And I need to change the survey for that. Um, so I use this JSON object survey. And now the nice thing happens. I just hit save. Quarkus picks this up. And then as I keep examining my output topic, this will pick up the change there. Now I see, okay, this is what my application produced now. It's just going to restart the consumer with JQ. So it's a bit uh, limited, but actually now I can keep going and work on this pipeline and see you know, um, how the output on this enriched topic changes. So let's say I want to, um, well, actually now I'm doing the join. I was a bit ahead of time. So now I'm doing actually this, um, this join there. Um, so I take the data from the other side of the topic uh, at the station name, the coordinates, and then again, I use another survey for that. And um, I hit save once more. And actually I'm using this um, survey, which comes from Debezium, the, um, which just takes this new state of my change events out of the, uh, out of the records and produce, uh, you know, deserializes that. So that's what's happening there. And <clears throat> Then I can take this and, and, and save it. And now I see those attributes which come from the other side, like the name, the coordinates. I see this also in my, in my topic there. And now what I can do next is I can do some data change there. So uh, let me go to the database and I'm, for the sake of the example, I'm just updating all the columns, uh, all the names of all my weather stations and set it to Hamburg, which is where I live. And then you would see in this output topic, okay, so now, Hamburg that gets joined into the day, uh, into this output topic there. <clears throat> so that's how I can uh, keep working on that. And now the next thing really to do is, or just to give you an impression how this feels like. So I'm now doing, so I want to have the average value per weather station. So I do a grouping by weather station, by the key, then I aggregate the values per weather station and take the average essentially. Then, um, well, yeah, I need to do, uh, again, I need to change the difference. I need to use a different survey there. And then uh, for the sake of the example, I have this nice method, which, you know, just shows a visual representation of my temperature uh, using some emojis. So I also add this into the mix, um, call this method there, add it as another property <clears throat> based on the temperature value. 
Um, I hit save once more, and then I'm going to see how the output looks like now with the average value and also with the emojis on, the, uh, uh, on this output topic. Now, I hope this gives an idea as to how you can work using the dev mode uh, on this pipeline, explore how your changes um, would you know, be consumed. And I, I feel it's a nice productive way on working uh, of such kind of application. All right, so let's get back to the slides there. And I should go here. So in this real like first use case, you can do if you combine um, Debezium and Kafka streams, you can enrich a data stream which you have, in this case, those temperature measurements, and enrich it with master data coming from a database by joining those two things together. So the next one I wanted to talk about is auditing. So very often people would like to have an audit log of their data. And also, you know, a Kafka topic with change events, that's a little bit like an audit log already. Um, but then we want to have some metadata, like what's the user who did a certain change or what's the use case identifier and things like that. And we cannot capture this from the transaction log because you wouldn't have this, table, this data in your tables, really. And we can implement this by just um, you know, um, expanding our application a bit. The idea is it writes this metadata to another um, table, transactions, and this table would be uh, using the transaction ID as a primary key. So for each um, transaction your application does, it would insert a record with this, um, it would insert a record with this, um, with this um, metadata there. And now what you can do is you can, Again, set up the BSIM to also capture this transactions table. So you would have two topics there, one with the actual customer change events or whatever your example is about or your domain is about, and you would have the transactions topic. Then you can use Kafka streams to, again, join those things and enrich the actual customer events with this transaction metadata and write it back to another topic. Now, in terms of data, how does this look like? Well, here I have my customer change events and here, this is how my um, transactions topic and the events there could look like. Now, if you look closely, you have the transaction ID on both sides. So our Debezium change events, they have a transaction ID as part of the source metadata. And now this transactions topic, this also uses the transaction ID as the primary key and in turn also as the message key in Kafka. And this is how I can correlate those events. So actually I can take now the data from the transactions topic for my given transaction and for instance, write it into this source block, right? So the user use case, whatever metadata I have. And then I could write it back to this enriched topic and I would have a nice audit log, which I either could keep in Kafka if I have a long retention there, or I could write it out to another um, data warehouse where I would like to have this data and I would be able to see the history of my data, including this metadata. And I actually, Implementing this is this is a bit tricky because you um, what you need to remember is you don't have ordering guarantees across topics. So this means if you receive let's say this custom customer change event in your Kafka Streams app, well you, it might be you don't have the transaction metadata event for this just yet. So essentially you need to buffer the customer change event and you need to wait until you have seen the transaction metadata event and. Doing implementing this it, well it requires interaction with a Kafka Stream state store. Um, but uh, you know it, it's a bit of coding and actually we have this nice blog post here on the blog so there and also a fully built example where you can see how to do is there's a bit more complexity to it so that's auditing now, now the next one i wanted to mention is um expanding partial update events and this comes up pretty often well i, I mentioned in our in the BCM, you would always have like the old state of a row and the new state of a row and actually, well, that's true on a general level, but there are some exceptions for that. So for instance, in MongoDB, you don't have the full uh, new row state, for instance. Instead, you just get what's called a patch. So it just describes what are the fields of the document which have changed. And it's the same with Postgres. So there you can configure different replica identities. And if you don't use replica identity full, which increases the size of your transaction log, um, well, you wouldn't have, um, let's say, columns which haven't changed. Or there's this notion of toasted columns, which is a special way of storing values. And if such a toasted column hasn't changed in, in Postgres, well, it would get this Debezium unavailable value marker, which tells you, okay, you know, this, there's this change event, but then this particular column didn't change its value. You don't get the value from transaction log. Um, so something needs to be done about it. And there's a few other cases where we would benefit from that. And again, some stream processing 
uh, would help there because what we could do is we could have a stateful stream processing app and this would use a state store and actually if we receive the initial event for such a uh, um, record there we would have uh, to stay to stick to this example with the, with the toasted column we would have its value so we could take it from the initial event, maybe it's an insert event or a snapshot event, and we put it into a state store. And then if you later on get this partial update, you could go to the state store and retrieve the value of this column from the state store. And then we can you know, write it back to our change event. And then we would have the full um, update event also if it didn't contain this unchanged value originally. And by the way, this visualization here, it's done using this uh, nice project Kafka Streams with, um, so that's pretty cool. Um, it allows you to take a uh, Kafka Streams app and just create a visual representation of its topology. So that's quite useful if you want to reason about your, um, your um, uh, you know, Kafka Streams pipelines. How does it look in terms? How does it look like in terms of the implementation? Well, I would have such a value transformer. So this is what I have as a primitive in Kafka Streams, which would take my values there and uh, enrich them, and it would do so using such a key values. And now I need to initialize this. This is just a store which is backed by RocksDB. So really, it's I can do key-based lookups. That's really it's like a persistent map. And now my actual so I have the state store. In, in my actual implementation, what I can do now is um, if I receive this um, unavailable value marker, then I know, OK, I need to have this value already in the state store from the previous insert or from the previous snapshot event. So I will take, I will get the event from the state store and I will, you know, write it into my change event. Or if I get an actual value for this column, then I would just put it to the state store and I, you know, my, my event already is, um, is um, good enough. So that's the idea. Really either write the data to the state store or get it out of the state store and then write it into my change event. And now my, the change event which I produce here, which I send to my consumers, this is complete and a consumer wouldn't have to deal with this semantics of those um, partial updates events. All right. And now the last thing we need to mention, and unfortunately I'm running a bit out of time, but uh, the last thing I wanted to mention is this uh, use case of, of aggregate view materialization. So the idea there is, uh, well, by default in DBZM, you, you get a topic per table. And very often you have a use case like this, where you have such a one-to-end relationship. Uh, so purchase order and another table with order lines. And it's like, you know, one purchase order can have multiple lines. And now I would get, those change events on two topics, one for the orders, one for the order lines. Whereas in some cases, I would like to have a combined event. Uh, so maybe I would like to store this data in an Elasticsearch index, and there I really would have a document which contains uh, one purchase order and all its lines, uh, so like a JSON structure like this. Or if I want to store it to MongoDB or send it to other services, I would like to have all the data you know from this aggregate in terms of domain driven design with a single event so that's a very common requirement and again kafka streams it helps us there so what we can do uh, first of all is we can use what's called the non-key join so that's a new improvement in kafka 2.4 was added with this kip 213 kafka improvement proposal and um this allows us to implement this kind of joining logic quite nicely because now my uh, I wouldn't have the same key on both sides. I would uh, have the primary key of the purchase orders as the message key for the purchase order topic. And I would have the order line ID as the uh, message key for the order line topic. And well, before KIP 213, I couldn't easily join those things. Whereas now, well, I do have a foreign key uh, in my order lines, of course. So actually now I can also join on this foreign key. And now this is actually, I would say, quite self-descriptive. So I set up two K tables, which does give me the current state there of my order lines and my purchase orders. I um, Then I join it and I do join this on the purchase order ID. So I correlate the um, purchase order IDs. And then I produce essentially a joint result for each order line. So it contains like this join row. Then I group it by the um, uh, purchase order ID. So I, you know, I want to have this uh, aggregate purchase 
order to aggregate it. So that's what I'm doing here. Essentially, I have an object which just allows me to add a purchase order um, or which allows me to remove a purchase order if this is about deleting a purchase order. And now this is all I need to do with the KIP 213 to have this kind of join. And there's just one problem with that. And this is this also exposes uh, what's called intermediary aggregate. So let's say I have a transaction which inserts a purchase order and then uh, f five lines. Well, ideally, I would only like to see the outcome of this join once, once I have received all the five change events or all the six change events, like one plus five. And now with the basic join, well, this would run essentially whenever there's a new um, message on either side of the join. So I would also see a join which maybe contains purchase order and then just the first two lines. And that's not what I want. So I need to have some sort of awareness of transaction boundaries. And this is actually what gets enabled in DBSIM as of lately. We have the option to provide some more metadata about transactions. So in our source, in our change events, I can have to this transaction uh, information like what's the ID, of course, but then also what's the order of this change event within the transaction. And then there is another topic which gets produced, and this contains marker events. When does a transaction begin and when does a transaction end? And now, um, Actually, this allows me to implement this kind of buffering because, well, this transaction marker event, it would tell me, okay, in this transaction 571, I have one change event for the orders topic. I have five events for the order line topic. Now I could implement a Kafka Streams application, which, you know, does this sort of buffering and it only would emit the join result once it has received those six events. So, and then I wouldn't have emitted those intermediary aggregates. So um, I don't have a, uh, you know, ready-made example for this yet, but I, I think we will have something about this on the blog, but then there's, you know, the means of doing this, this is provided now in, in DBSIM and you can actually make use of this transaction metadata topic. SMT, so I'm going to skip over that because we are, I think we are pretty uh, pretty much at the end of the time, just briefly. Uh, yes. Sometimes just, you don't just need like, to do... Yes, we are only yeah. one minute and a half, by the way, so... That's what we have left, right? Yes, yeah, so just be quick, please. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. So really, sometimes, you know, if you do stateless transformations, just go with SMTs because they run in Kafka Connect itself. It means you doesn't need to spin up a separate process. Um, you know, that's something to keep in mind. And really with that, I'm actually done. Um, so it, I, it took me a bit longer than I expected, actually. <laughs> but um, really, the, the, key, the key takeaway is if you combine Debezium and Kafka Streams, um, you know, you get all sorts of interesting use cases, which you couldn't do with just the BSM itself. So we saw this enrichment, we saw this aggregation, streaming queries, all those kinds of things, and you get them by combining um, the BSM and Kafka streams. And of course, well, Quarkus, as I hope I could show, is a good runtime, a good basis for running your Kafka streams application on the JVM and also as a native binary um, via GraalVM. So that's the gist of it. Um, well, I. I think those things stay nicely combined. And lastly, just a few resources. Um, everything is on the website, thebism.io. We have tons of examples on GitHub. So you definitely can see, you know, the KIP 213 join, all those kinds of things. They're auditing. That's all in the examples repo. Um, follow us on Twitter. And um, with that, I'm done. I think we have 20 seconds for questions, but we have to discuss. Yes, <laughs> no, it's actually no. Yes, it's 20 seconds for, for staying on air, I, by the way. So then Gleb will join us. And uh, yes, uh, so I guess we have to discuss this question that we had in discussions. So I really hope yes, um, more people will join. Uh, we only have the Zoom links for that. So um, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. And yeah, Gleb is back. Nice to see you back. Right. Yeah, thanks. Um, I watched the entire talk. Uh, it was awesome. I was not actually much familiar with the Bizium or change data capture before, but now like can like immediately see a few very nice use cases for it. Like uh, if I understand correctly, suppose I have a legacy application which I don't know I don't have the sources for. I cannot modify the exactly database. Right. I cannot do anything. But I just take the Bizium, It takes in the changes, and then bam! I can spin a ton of stuff on top of it. Right. Right. This is what exactly. uh, so Gunnar that's legacy it integration data that's liberation. Well, I, yes, I, I, I am impressed. <laughs> so, and uh, cool, uh, perhaps great. I missed this part. So, uh, uh, is there like broad support? I saw MySQL and Postgres, and is there a whole range of other stuff that you can work with? 
Right. Yeah, there's MongoDB, Sequencer. I mentioned the incubating one for um, Oracle, incubating support for Vitesse. Um, Cassandra is also incubating. So, and also DB2 is incubating, actually. So it's, you know, there's a set of stable ones and a set of incubating ones. Cool. And do I like need to do any changes to the deployment of the databases that I'm capturing the data from or not? Yes, uh, you, yes. Uh, I mean, it depends on the database, but typically you need to do some sort of configuration, right? So you will have to talk to your DBA, let's say, to enable the right log level of the transaction log, things like that. So, it's, uh, you know, it's not fully transparent from a database operations point of view. Um, it requires some configuration, but, you know, typically it's not a huge deal. The one thing you need to keep in mind is if you use like a managed cloud database, whether you can do this or not. So that's some that sometimes can be tricky if they don't expose the right options for you. Yeah, I can imagine there were some difficulties when I tried to do something in the managed, uh, say, RDS with... Uh, exactly right. I mean, RDS, well. that's fine, uh, by the way. Um, where it does not currently work for Postgres is the Google uh, managed Postgres. So mm -hmm. there's a ticket, you all can vote there. I would like to have support for DBZoom on the Google Postgres too. <laughs> all right. Uh, I'm really impressed. I already mentioned it, but wow. Thanks. Thank you for the talk. Thank you a lot for the by work the that you have done. <laughs> Yes, yeah, one small thanks, question. Thanks for having me. That's... Yes, there, there is there is this question from my side that I write just right now. It's about Kafka and so on. But what about managed services? So we are very cloud now, and there are a lot of cloud yeah. um, managed services provided by the by the vendor itself. So uh, sometimes it's not exactly Kafka, but some some of it forks. Uh, not to mention the exact uh, oh. uh, vendors. Yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, are, are, yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, do you actually support this, or uh, do you have the use cases? For right. You? Yeah. Uh, so just definitely. Briefly. I mean. Um, sure. Yeah. A few things. Really. Um, well, first of all, you can always run connect yourself. Oh. Kafka connect. Uh, I'm yourself, sorry right? to interrupt. So uh, but would you mind taking this question to the discussion zone because we do have to switch to the next one on this track. Oh, and, yes, by the way. Yes. Uh, yes, uh, I guess it's a perfect time to just uh, get the link that you have to the Zoom chat to the discussion zone and invite all the audience right. there. Mitya will be the moderator and I think you will have a lot yes. of fun. Thank you so much. You see, yep. even oh, even seventy five minutes is not enough. <laughs> yes. Yep. Yeah, I'm, I, I'm surprised actually because I did not expect that. <laughs> All right. See you.